All right then, praise the Lord. Let me just pray and then we're going to start. Glorious Father, glory to your name. Glory to everything that's good about what we've enjoyed, what we've embraced, what we've connected to. Glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much that Jesus has come into our lives and transformed the very reality of what we've always known in terms of how it's been. Thank you that you are the one who transforms. You change us. You love us so much that you, and you transform us. Take us, transfer us from one place to another. And wherever we are now, Lord, our prayer is that you would use this word to transfer us from one place to another. Yeah. We want to go where you want us to go and do what you want us to do and be what you want us to be and say what you want us to say. Father, we want your will in our lives to be done <coughs> on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. That your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Glory to you, Father. Glory, glory, glory to you. Let your Holy Spirit take the words that I speak and use them to convey to the people the very reality of what it means in these words, the truth that they contain, the message, the carriers of the message. Let that come. Let it come into the thoughts and hearts and minds. Lord, let there be seed that is not snatched away by the, the birds and the thorn and the thistle. Let your grace, your grace come and transfer us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So I had two choices in my preparation and I had two godly inspirations uh, and I chose this one. I could have chose that one. Now, you don't know what that one is. Uh, I do. And uh, you would have been extremely blessed by it, uh, but I can't go into that at the moment because I was going to get distracted. It would have been an incredible service. We'd have all been really filled with a sense of uh, wonder at the love of God. But I've got this one, and, uh, and I think I might have chose right, because uh, the stuff that's gone on during the, the worship, which is, which is really wonderful. You, uh, you may not know me, my name is Paul, Paul Shepherd. I'm the pastor of this church. I've been here for about 18 years now. Um, I looked younger than this when I came. Uh, I had more hair, and uh, uh, even Richard had more hair. And uh, it was wonderful then, wasn't it? We had, uh, it was great. But those days have gone. Uh, but we are here now, and uh, we're here to embrace and, and just touch heaven today. And that's what I, I want us to do, touch heaven. I don't believe in just imparting knowledge for the sake of knowledge. I've never been that kind of preacher. You, you know, there are a lot, a lot better people than me that can tell you things. My intention is, is, is always been to, to invest in you, yeah. so that you might benefit from the investment of the truth that God brings to us through his word. And uh, so, really, we are the carriers of the message. We are the, those who carry this message forward. And we live in difficult times, very difficult times, uh, when, uh, you know, persecution is just around the corner. And um, in many lands across the world, it's already begun. Uh, many suffer, Christians suffer in many places for their faith in the gospel. And so uh, we need to take advantage. Jesus himself said 2,000 years ago, work while it's still day. For the night time is coming when no man will be able to work. And the message will not be able to be proclaimed so freely in the end as it is in, in the now. So we need to take full advantage of the now so that those around us might benefit from the reality of the message. And uh, I think that the Church of Jesus Christ has pontificated on the message of the gospel for too long. And I think we need to, once again, take hold of what God has inspired us regarding what it is that we are to do with the message. So when I began to think and pray about this, uh, the, really, the thing that challenged me the most, the thing that got me kind of inspired the most, was the, the, the fact that, um, that, that Jesus when he thought about the proclamation of the message, when Jesus thought about it, he, he said something which was quite challenging. He said these words. He said, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. And, uh, and that kind of challenged me really because it made me think. That's what challenges are. So 
uh, the challenge was really which came out of that which was how should we pray for the lost so that's the big question today how should we pray for the lost i guess i guess we all got people around us that aren't yet saved and i guess i guess that we will be proactive i guess with our prayers in terms of asking god to intervene in the reality of their lives regarding the gospel so i guess that we are all associated with the truth of these words in terms of how should we pray for the lost and that's the real the big question here so in acts 26 18 and the apostle paul says this jesus is talking to paul and he's basically calling him to go to the gentiles so we interrupt the verse 18 and it says to open their eyes, this is Jesus speaking, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. They may, they may turn from darkness to light. That they may be, as it were, transformed from the dominion of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So Jesus is saying these words. He's saying... In effect, when we're praying for the lost, what we're actually doing is we're asking God, we're asking God to open the eyes, to, 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 to move them from darkness to light, to receive forgiveness of their sins, that they might repent, and that they might receive the inheritance <coughs> through the sanctification by faith, through grace in Jesus. Yeah. So that's the message. But you'll remember last week's message when I said that unless we have faith to believe what we ask for, we ask in vain. Our prayers are not answered if we don't have faith. God requires Christians, people who are going to pray to him, to have faith in, in, prayer, in the prayers that they ask for. So for example, Mark 11, 24, 20. Five says this, therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe, that's what I spoke on last week, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. So don't come to God and make requests of God on behalf of stuff in prayer if your heart is in a place of unforgiveness because God doesn't listen to you he says actually the prayers of James says the prayers of a righteous man woman accomplishes much which means that God listens he's attentive to the to the words of a righteous person now the righteousness that we have found ourselves in is not a righteousness obtained through us being good but through a righteousness that God has given through Jesus to make us good now if we have been made good we can then make request of God in righteousness so we're not condemned by the fact that we fall short of the standard that God has set but we rejoice in the fact that God has given us a new standing with him because we have put our faith not in ourselves to obtain salvation, but we have put our faith in God through Jesus to obtain salvation. So the reality of believing then, the reality of believing then, and knowing that we're going to get our prayers answered, is built around us trusting what God says. So, unless we ask with faith, we will miss it. We have to believe when we ask. We have to believe when we ask. And today is an example of believing for the loss that you pray for. Last week we talked about other things. But it doesn't matter what we talk about. The key reality of getting anything from God is ask, believing that you have received what you have asked for. And anything short of that will be missed. Now, I know... God is a God of mercy. And sometimes, a lot of the time, God moves his hand 
of mercy, which is why a lot of us get what we get. But what we need to, is to grow a community of God's people who are not just reliant on the mercy of God, but that will grow up in maturity so that they start trusting God, so that we are built up in our faith regarding taking back people who are in darkness and drawing them into the presence of God because we have grown in our understanding of what it means to be a faithful person. So the key to move in heaven is to act in faith. The key to move in heaven to act is faith. We need to believe when we ask. And I've got a big long list of scriptures here that you can take with you if you want a copy. I'm very happy to give me. I won't read them because there's so many. So, having established the fact that we need to ask in faith, believing that we have received, what is it that we should be asking? So, Romans uh, chapter 4, 14 says this. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard and how will they hear without a preacher and how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news good things how beautiful how beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. What that's saying is this, when the, when the messenger comes and brings good news to you, there is an appreciation, there is a beautiful, you look at his feet, her feet, and you see, the, you see the, the, the carriers of the message, the feet of those who bring good news to you. And God has called us to be carriers of the good news. So the, but the key to moving heaven is to act, believing. So here, Paul wants us to capture that unless someone goes and tells them, unless they are willing to go, the lost don't hear. So what should we ask? Well, we should, when we pray, believe in, we should ask, pray for workers to go to the people. That's what Jesus said. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. For the harvest is ready. But the labourers are few. The harvest is ready, but the labourers are few. What Jesus is instructing us to do as disciples is to pray to God, pray to God that the people who you are praying for will have the privilege of receiving the message, the gospel, from the feet, the beautiful feet of the carriers of the message. So God brings his revelation to people as people, Christians, go with that message to the lost. So our prayer, Jesus' instruction, is that we would be workers who go to the people. Pray for people, another pray, pray for people to get the opportunity to hear and believe and receive God's word. Now we live in a technological age and there's incredible opportunity to get the message out in so many ways. But we can pray that the people we're praying for who are lost can hear and see and receive the word of the gospel, the message, the carriers of the message will bring that word to those who are yet saved. Faith comes, says the scripture, faith comes through hearing the word. And these ones who are still lost need to hear the word. 
lest they have nothing to believe in. I said last week, unless the word is proclaimed, any word, there's no opportunity to believe the word. And so unless they hear the word, they cannot believe the word because they are in darkness of the word. They need to hear the word, which is to come into the light of the word so that the light of the word can be considered by them in regards to their considerations of thought and feelings, emotions. They might be able to embrace it, at least have the opportunity to calculate it, to assess it, to evaluate it, however you want to say it. But unless the message is gone forth, then there's no opportunity for those to consider. And we need to pray that the word would get out to the lost in any way God chooses to use. So faith comes through hearing the word. The word has to get out. Pray that they will connect to Christians. You know, we can pray for people to connect to Christians yeah. to so because they're going to have the greatest opportunity. Yeah. We hope, we hope they will, yeah. that they will connect to Christians so that Christians over here and over there and in that person's life and that situation there and other countries can connect to Christians to get the opportunity to see the revelation of the message portrayed to them. Pray for angelic visitation, for dreams and visions. Many times in the Bible, the, many have dreams and visions regarding God and who he is. But in John 16, uh, verse 8, uh, we read about the Holy Spirit who brings conviction concerning sin and judgment. And now there is a reality to the truth that those who will come to Jesus will have to repent of a life choice of ignoring God. Now that's the reality. Unless we repent, we cannot be saved. But if we confess our sin to God, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Now that is a message. And unless they hear that message, then they're not going to have an opportunity to receive that message. And someone has got to tell them that message in order for them to have the opportunity to receive that message. So we can pray for them to connect to Christians. Pray for angelic uh, visitation as the Holy Spirit brings that conviction to their lives. Pray for their eyes to be open. Acts tells us about that. To open the eyes of the blind. that, that They can't see, but open their eyes. And when they see, they will be so grateful to you that your feet will be beautiful because you are the carrier of the good news, the message of the gospel. But let me tell you this. If we pray these prayers without faith, we will see nothing. But we won't see answers to our prayers unless we send our prayers out from ourselves to heaven in faith. Faith is the key to connecting heaven to the reality of the solutions that we ask God for. We can ask God for all things. Pray God will give the unsaved the opportunity to hear and see the gospel because it's not just the gospel of words, it's the gospel of demonstration. You remember, you remember, I've got a quick story. You remember a year or so ago, two years maybe, I said about, I encourage you to pray for five people. And uh, I've been praying for my five. It's increased somewhat, a little bit. But I've been praying for my five. And just three quick testimonies. I, I prayed for my brother. My brother's an interesting guy. We're, hopefully you'll meet him one day, Leslie. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I was praying, and I, and I was praying, I was praying, like every day, every day, every day I was praying. And I was thinking, is anything happening? Well, Christmas time, I bumped into Leslie. We went out, we, we went, family thing, went up to Leeds. I don't know why we went up there. We went up to Leeds and uh, we managed to get back. And we, and we went up to Leeds and we just spent some time uh, with the family. And um, during that a meal time that we had together, a legend told me that he bumped, he's a builder, developer. He bumped into a, a man who was a Christian pastor and uh, he priced a job up. Didn't get the job, but the pastor connected to Leslie. And every day from that day, and this is about two years ago or more, every day from that day onwards, the pastor, five days a week, sends Leslie a, a biblical reference from the scripture. 
Um, he uses a biblical reference. He texts it to, to Leslie. And then Leslie texts it to me. And uh, every day my brother gets the message of God from this pastor. I don't know who he is. But he's doing the kingdom stuff. He's the feet of him who's bringing good news to my brother Leslie. And my, and my sister Lynn, another situation. I'm praying for her, but I didn't realise anything's happening. And all of a sudden I found out that she's gone back to church. And she, she's gonna, she, she goes to a Methodist church, so, you know. But, she goes, <laughs> but she, she, she's gone back to church and she's going to get confirmed in the Methodist church. You know, yeah. wonderful, you know. Yeah. And God is moving. God is answering the prayers. We need, when we pray to God, to believe that he will give us what we ask for. So how, God, how does God bring anyone to repentance? To put their trust in Jesus Christ as their saviour. So that they receive the gifts God gives. You know, the gift of forgiveness. That's a gift. We take it for granted, but let me tell you this. There would be many poison at dinner if it wasn't for the gift of forgiveness. Truly, you would sit at the table and you would be hostile to one another. Mm. But forgiveness is a gift given to the world. Yeah. Uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of eternal life. You know, this is not, it's, this is not it. This isn't all that there is. You should have cheered then. <laughs> this isn't all there is. There is another reality to this. Oh, this is good. We love it. It's great. We enjoy it. Make the most of it. Do everything we can to embrace it. Live like we never could never live. Do live life to its full. Ecclesiastes says, but remember God. Remember God. <coughs> live in every possible way. But this isn't it. This is just a temporary reality. There is an eternity. Now, how are they going to hear about the eternity unless someone tells them, bringing the message to them? There is an eternity beyond the grave. A very sad thing when people die. My other brother died last year, 63 years old. He's gone. There is a message, there, there is a, 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 a reality beyond the grave. We need to tell them this message. The gift of eternal life with God. The gift of salvation, that's the connecting to God. The gift to live God's way in overcoming the flesh. You know, the gift of sanctification. God empowering us with the grace to overcome. The gift of understanding, <coughs> the gift of understanding his word. You can't read the Bible and understand it unless you have the spirit of God bringing that revelation to you. Oh, you might obtain knowledge. But you won't understand the Bible. Right. You can't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit's help. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit brings the revelation to us. Amen. By the truth being spoken to them is what they get to evaluate. And unless we tell them these good message news, this good news message... Unless we tell them about forgiveness, about the Holy Spirit, about eternal life, about salvation, about overcoming the flesh, about understanding. Unless we tell them they're in darkness, their eyes are closed, they cannot see. In Matthew 9, Jesus said these words, 35, 38. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel to the kingdom and healing, showing, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion. That's what motivated him. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and desperate. That's pretty bad, like this world we live in today. They were dis distressed and, and desperate, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers the workers are few, therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to go into the harvest field. So Jesus was motivated by compassion and he demonstrated the reality of the gospel by doing the good things of God in their lives. He healed the sick and he restored the broken. Luke chapter 4, the message of that revelation. 
He showed and he told the reality of the message of the gospel. He was talking to them, proclaiming to them the gospel. He was healing them and showing them the gospel. He was motivated by compassion. I wonder, are you motivated? They were sheep without a shepherd. They were lost and needed to be found. They were lost and they needed to be found. He said these words, the harvest. No, not the harvest. He said his harvest. His harvest was ready to be brought in, which means he'd already been sowing. He'd already been going before, sowing seed. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. And the Lord of the harvest is God. And he said, pray to God that he would send out workers. Pray that he would send out workers into the harvest field. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said these words, Go ye, go ye, go ye. In Luke 10, 1, it says this, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others, and he sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. See, they're the seed sowers. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray that the Lord would send out workers into the harvest with the message of the good news. The people that you're praying for, the lost that you're praying for, you need to pray that God will connect them to the message of the good news in any way God chooses to, to do so. We need to see the reality of these things come to pass. You see, brothers and sisters, even as we are asking God to move into that situation, there are Christians around the world that are asking God to move in this situation. What does that mean? It means this. It means that you could be the answer to the prayers of other Christians as you show and tell the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to those who live around you and live as part of your world. You can be the fulfilment of their prayers, even as they can be the fulfilment of your prayers. Unless we go with the beautiful feet to those who are lost in darkness, distressed and in despair, unless they hear the message, unless they see the message, then they will not be able to evaluate whether the possibility of them connecting to God is on the agenda. But what if you don't? Then they won't hear. That's the truth. And for 2,000 years, the church has hid itself in the sand like an ostrich and has not gone. Even though Jesus said, go, the church has not gone. And if no one goes with those beautiful feet, <coughs> then no one will hear and no one will see. Their eyes will not be opened. But someone, Cory Ten Boone, someone said about Cory Ten Boone, when she gets to heaven, she was a, a woman in the, the prison war camps, she said when she gets to heaven, she's going to want to look around her and see the people she invited. If we don't go, then they won't know. Jesus has told us to go. The evangelical church for the last 2,000 years has told them to come. Come. And they haven't come. And even when they have come, they haven't understood what we've done. I mean, we're a pretty weird bunch. Amen. You know, we have, we have a language that's peculiar. You know, 
Jesus told us to go, but the church has said come. Jesus says get out there and show and tell them. Go and love them. Go and serve them. Go and do the message stuff. You see, I believe, I believe that some have said this, but I'm not like that. That's just not me. But I believe that we are all called to be witnesses of the gospel. We are all called to be witnesses of the gospel. I mean, Peter couldn't put it more clearly when he says, that always be ready to give an account of the hope that is within you. Well, the hope that is within us is the gospel. That's what any of us have got. Peter 3.15 Why are we intimidated? Why are we intimidated by the lost? Their perspective and their judgmental attitude towards us. Why are we intimidated by the, the lost perspective of us? They are lost. We are the ones that are found. They don't know the way. They, you ever seen sheep wander around a, a field? They're just all over the place. They get in all sorts of trouble. That's what they do. And they're lost. Why are we looking for them to advise us when we have been found? We know the way. We know the voice of the Good Shepherd. We've learned to trust Him and obey Him and see the reality of what He says come to pass. <coughs> Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but by me. You know, we are not spooks. Those of you who don't know what spooks are, we are not like secret agents. But often you think Christians are secret agents. They turn up for years at their place of employment and then they discover that the person they've been working with for the last 30 years is also a Christian like them. But they've been living undercover for so long that they haven't realised that they could have had a prayer meeting for the rest of the company. Because <laughs> they're afraid, they think they're spooks, they think they're secret agents living undercover. <laughs> but we're not spooks. <clears throat> we're not secret agents. We're soldiers in the Lord's army. You know, onward Christian soldiers, marching out to war. But what about if they criticise us if we tell them the message. What about if they, they, they gossip about us? What about if they don't like us anymore? What about if they start throwing stones at us? What does Jesus say? Blessed are ye are persecuted for righteousness sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5. <coughs> Blessed. And if we don't go, but we keep our light under a bushel, under, you know, I'm not sure what a bushel is, but under one of those things there, the bushels, yeah. If we keep it hidden, then they won't see that light. But we are those who are the proclaimers of the truth. We are soldiers in the Lord's army. And yes, sometimes they're going to shoot us. And sometimes some of us are going to die. And sometimes some of us are going to get criticised. But that's okay. That's okay. It's all right. It's not a problem that you have less friends or that they don't like you as much. It's okay. Because you love them more than you love their darkness. You have a compassion for them more than the fear of their rejection. Go and proclaim to them by telling others Telling them about God's love, about God's forgiveness. Go and proclaim how they can reconnect to God. Go and show them the truth about God so that they can see God through the way you live your life, through your deeds of faith. Go and demonstrate the compassion of God by works of service. And as Romans says, acts of kindness. It's the kindness of the Lord that draws it's a powerful weapon. Yeah. Sacrifice is a powerful weapon. Service is a powerful weapon. They're all demonstrations of how we can convey the gospel. Sometimes we can 
preach to them, talk to them. But there's a whole lot we can do to demonstrate to them the gospel. How will they hear unless someone tells them? And I remember sitting in my front room when I was 19 years old, having become a Christian, having just lost my brother-in-law because he fell off a ladder, broke his neck and died. And I connected to God afresh. And I remember reading the words, Whom shall I send? Isaiah. Whom shall I send? <coughs> and I remember sitting there in that little front room of mine. We had a three-piece suite that was so big there was no more room. <laughs> there was literally no room in there. We had, when you sat down on my feet, but you touched knees. It was so small. But we loved our flat. We had £12 a week for it. <coughs> but when I sat there in my little front room in my Bible listening and, and considering this scripture, whom, whom shall I send? I remember putting my hand up in my, in my, in my heart and saying to God, God, send me. I, I, I will go. I will go. I would go and tell them and proclaim to them and reveal to them the truth, the message of the gospel. God, I'll go and be someone that has beautiful feet. Now, if you saw my feet, you would know that that isn't true. But, but, but I, I would go and bring beautiful, a beautiful message to them. I'm going to ask Richard to pray. So come close your eyes. But during his prayer... Uh, hear the prayer, the word of the Lord. Whom shall I send? Who's going to go? And I want you to demonstrate to God, God, I want to be a carrier of the message. So as Richard prays, just put your hand up and say, God, I want to be one of those guys. Father, well, thank you that the, uh, the message you give us is, is good news. Uh, and Father, just uh, let's reflect on uh, what that good news is. Uh, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the son uh, in the name of God's one and only son Father thank you that this is good news thank you that uh, you want to welcome us uh, to your courts with joy. Thank you. Amen. Amen.